The state of the Acadian forest between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia is bad, very bad, and getting worse all the time. Less than 1% of mature, old-growth Acadian forest remains, and of those lands where woods seem to be standing, the ecosystems of the terrain have been so grossly disrupted that they can barely be called maritime or Acadian ecosystems at all. Since due to avaricious, rampant, and barely regulated forestry operations, these forests have been clear-cut again and again and again leaving little opportunity for the long-term ecosystems that can develop only an undisturbed forest to have a chance to perpetuate themselves. Using flight simulators that portray the terrain based on satellite imagery, I have been posting videos presenting the utterly devastated state of the forests of New Brunswick. Some persons have questioned the validity of those videos though. So today, we are going to take a look at an actual flight departing Moncton and flying to Hillsdale, almost 100 kilometers away. And you will be able to see the state of the forest as portrayed using actual aerial videography. I'll tell you right now that you will see two things in this video. One is that the devastation of the forest ecosystems of New Brunswick as portrayed in the satellite imagery through the flight simulator that I have used in the past is very accurate. Two, and even more importantly, it is difficult in this entire flight to find a place where the ecosystem is healthy and unblemished. We are just now departing the urban area of the Moncton region, and you might discern from the pale color of the ground and the leafless state of the deciduous trees that this footage has been filmed in spring, while in the shadows there is still snow on the ground in some places, in open areas it has just melted away. When the terrain is filmed during the white of winter, the snow can mask out the state of the land. Conversely, when the terrain is filmed during the depths of summer, green growth can also mask out the damage done to the land. But filming at this time, when the snow is mostly gone and before foliage is regrown, allows us to more easily perceive the damage done to the land by way of jagged stumps, clear-cut areas, exposed regions where topsoil can be leached away and the other scars we might find over the land that denote clear cuts. We're now beyond Moncton proper, and one can see that the entire forest below has already been clear cut. The striated patterns represent areas that heavy machinery has gone over and cut. The smooth, sort of olive drab green areas represent areas of partial regrowth, and the darker areas are thickets of coniferous trees. In fact, if you look closely at them, you'll see those thickets are almost purely coniferous trees, which, by and large, is an unnatural state of Acadian forests, which is naturally a blend of deciduous and coniferous trees of various species. So, when you see large areas of a monotonous green, especially at this time of the year when the deciduous trees are still bereft of leaves, typically what this means is that several decades ago that landscape was clear-cut, and it was either replanted with conifers, or the natural native forest was allowed to regrow but then some means was used to suppress the re-emergence of the deciduous trees. You can see that vast clearing off to the left. That's all very large clear cuts. But back to our topic at hand, some means had been used to remove the regrowth of those deciduous trees. A mechanical means perhaps, which would involve tree farmers going through the woods and mechanically cutting down any hardwood saplings and young trees they might have found. Though, more likely, especially given New Brunswick's history of very heavy applications of glyphosate and other pesticides to reduce and remove tree species the pulp cartel does not want to grow. These lands were treated with pesticides at some point with a specific goal of killing the hardwood trees, so that what we see regrowing throughout much of the landscape of New Brunswick is now not its native Acadian forest, but little more than a vast tree plantation. And as the deciduous trees have been intentionally and largely removed, this landscape has suffered a phenomenon referred to by ecologists and environmentalists as borealization. If you watched any of my previous videos on the New Brunswick Forestry Holocaust, you might recall previous discussion of borealization. Representatives of the Irvin Corporation, one of the largest forestry companies in New Brunswick, had contacted the dean of a university to question a pair of professors' usage of the term borealization in one of their papers. And those representatives of the Irving Corporation had made the claim that they had never heard of the term borealization before. And this, you might recall, was a claim that I took umbrage with. Because borealization is not a new concept. 
It is a term that refers to a relevant concern that has come up often in the realms of ecology and conservation. Borealization refers specifically to the cutting of autochthonous or native tree species, such as the deciduous species found throughout much of the Acadian forest, and the replacement of those species with conifer woods. Of course, there are other factors that play into borealization, and perhaps most relevant among them is that removing the varied tree species that are crucial to Acadian forest ecosystems shallows the ecosystem and makes it difficult for other species of plants, fungi, and fauna to grow. Honestly, the attempt by these so-called representatives of the Irving forestry industry to claim that they had never heard of borealization before was, well, it simply fell into the realms of pathetic. I think I can state with confidence that most anybody even loosely involved with issues of conservation and ecology in and around the Acadian ecosystem is familiar with the march of borealization. A progressive interruption and even destruction of the forestry ecosystem that is created specifically through the practice of cutting biodiverse forests and either replanting those forests with the coniferous tree species more predominant in the boreal north or simply preventing the diversity of deciduous species to grow, which forces a boreal-like ecosystem to emerge in a place where once an Acadian ecosystem predominated. In the opinion of myself and many others, JDI representatives contacting the dean of a university to question the use of the term borealization in an academic paper was simply harassment, a way of saying we're watching and we don't approve. And I think at this point it goes without saying that persons who question the status quo in the way that forestry is done in New Brunswick have a way of being dismissed, lost, finding their way out of jobs. All right, enough of that. We've covered another 20 kilometers or so while we were covering that topic, and as you saw, the entire landscape below is a patchwork of new clear cuts, moderately grown clear cuts, and tree farms at some point soon to be clear cut. And we're seeing even more of that here, where to the left and right and ahead, the entire landscape is a striated patchwork pattern of freshly clear cut forests and lands somewhere in the process of being converted into a tree farm, with the sole exception of the lower right where we can see a healthier blend of deciduous and coniferous forest beside one farm and surrounding another, which makes me think that this is a small bit of privately preserved land, where the ecosystem has been spared the gross woodland destruction that we see literally everywhere in front of us right now. Down there, several thousand feet below, you are seeing thousands of acres of clear-cut woods and forest being converted into simple virtually monocropped tree plantations. Now this brings up another very relevant topic that we should really take a close look at. The difference between a forest and clear-cut forests which are then replanted. Nova Scotia, my home province, and also New Brunswick, each have the misfortune of possessing an organization which serves as the advocacy voice of industrial forestry. Here in Nova Scotia it's called Forest Nova Scotia, and in New Brunswick it's likewise called Forest New Brunswick. And here in Nova Scotia, where our provincial government recently proposed a Biodiversity Act to keep intact the ecosystems of the Acadian forests as well as other ecosystems throughout the province, we saw forestry in Nova Scotia immediately launch into what amounted to war against the Biodiversity Act, flooding every MLA's office, as well as the offices of ministers and premiers, and practically every radio station and newspaper throughout the province, with a mail, spam, and ad war that was nothing but a disinformation campaign intended to stop the Biodiversity Act at any cost. Simultaneously, they faked an organization they called the Concerned Private Landowner Coalition, which they leveraged in this disinformation campaign to make it look as if thousands of private Nova Scotia landowners were terribly concerned about the Biodiversity Act, when in fact the Concerned Private Landowner Coalition did not exist. It had no members. They made it up. And on top of that, via their Facebook group for the Concerned Private Landowner Coalition, they launched what can only be described as a flame war intended to incite hatred, and I would go so far as to add potentially violence against conservationists, ecologists, and private woodlot owners who wanted to see the Biodiversity Act passed. Literally and outright mocking the concerns of ecology organizations such as the Ecology Action Center, the actions of forestry in Nova Scotia could leave no doubt that concerns regarding conservation throughout the Acadian forest were the last thing on their mind. Now there are reasons for this that go so deep that I simply don't have time to go into it in the span of this video. However, if you are interested in learning more, 
I created a six-part series on this disinformation campaign by Forestry Nova Scotia, and you can begin to learn about it at this link. But Forestry New Brunswick has not proven itself to be, in any meaningful way, different from Forestry Nova Scotia. And part of their own disinformation campaign has been the proliferation of this idea that when these forests are clear-cut, they can be replanted. They most certainly are not replanted. When a forest is clear-cut in New Brunswick, if indeed it is replanted at all, what is planted are the coniferous species, the borealizing species that industrial forestry is after. By and large, these will be species of spruce, at least at this latitude, and these conifers transform the living landscape to forest farms. What this means is that a biologically diverse forest, the Acadian forest, is destroyed and replaced with a tree farm. It's a region of land that might have trees. It might look at a casual glance like a forest, but it's not a forest. Tree farms do not offer biodiversity. They do not provide much in the way of food to wildlife. In fact, as conifer trees are naturally filled with inflammable pitch, they form a fire hazard. And that is one of the reasons we see so many more forest fires these days. It's not just an issue of global warming. It's also because while deciduous forests or Acadian forests are naturally fire resistant, boreal forests with trees full of pitch are not. Quite the opposite, in fact. You can learn about it here. Now, we don't see huge amounts of forest fires in actual boreal regions, because the soil in those regions is wet, there's permafrost in the ground, and the atmosphere is simply colder and damper. It's a boreal region after all. But here, in warmer Acadian regions, cutting Autochthonus Acadian forests, which are naturally fire resistant, and replacing those forests with borealized forests creates a fire hazard. These monocrop tree farms also acidify the soil over time. And as they create a large area with vulnerable conifer trees only, primarily spruces, but some other conifer species occasionally. These areas also become especially vulnerable to the spread of pathogens and also pests, such as the spruce budworm. In effect, the massive spread of these tree farms makes New Brunswick woods vulnerable to forest fires, diseases, and pests, all of which the natural Acadian forest that should be in New Brunswick should resist quite handily if it were left to its own devices. As you have seen so far, all of the landscape we have passed over, pretty much every last little bit of it, is disturbed forest ecosystem where the forest has been clear cut, if not recently, sometime not too long ago. And please bear in mind that in the lifespan of a forest, sometime not too long ago means even as far as several decades back. Here we're passing an area of settlements, farms in particular, and I can see directly below the striations that represent tree plantations, or, as those are very close together, perhaps Christmas tree farms. And we can also see, where you see the snow showing through the bare trunks of trees, those are deciduous patches. Perhaps these deciduous woods have been maintained for their value for biodiversity or firewood. This I don't know, but we do have some deciduous patches here. And it's not uncommon to see less disturbed forests in the immediate vicinity of farms and settlements. Clear cuts are unattractive, nobody likes them. But as you can see just up ahead, it's also not uncommon to see clear cuts because we have one just below center screen where it looks like there is a house on a small bit of acreage just left of the road at the center of the screen. I'm going to accelerate past this settled area now and you will see that as soon as we move beyond it, we're going to come back into a realm of clear cuts. Please note that you can see that there are clear cuts all throughout there. There's an enormous one just starting to show as the aircraft steer starboard it's now at the right center of the screen that is a truly vast clear cut and it seems to be quite recent and note that along the bands of the major road there are green spaces that are left to hide those clear cuts that's pretty common very common actually people don't like to see clear cuts so while they are not always hidden very often along roads that are frequently traveled some green spaces, which you might think of as cosmetic hedges, are left to hide the clear cuts. And it doesn't take much of a cosmetic hedge to hide one either. It need only be 10 to 20 meters thick in the right conditions. We'll fly directly over this few kilometers of agricultural area and hurry past it. As we go over it though, it does bring to mind a point. It's often said that agriculture is one of the greatest causes of loss of forests. However, here in Canada, with its low population, this is just not quite the case. Agriculture certainly has a toll on forests, 
But the primary cause of lost forest ecosystems is industrial scale forestry. And if anyone tells you differently, they're selling something. You can literally see this reality for yourself as we resume flying over what should be forest lands. Apart from those small open patches that represent agricultural areas, everywhere you look, the landscape is a patchwork of clear cuts and tree farms. I'll just be quiet a moment so we can absorb the scale of it. Apart from the fact that the New Brunswick forests are constantly clear-cut, regrown, then clear-cut again, and each time this happens, this impoverishes both soil and biodiversity. Another problem, and much less discussed, is the omnipresence of forestry access roads. Everywhere you go throughout New Brunswick, whether by land or by air, you will see them. Ostensibly, these roads exist to allow forestry personnel to access regions of woods, to assess timber conditions, and determine what they need to do in terms of forest farming operations, such as manually cutting away unwanted species, or making calls for the application of pesticides and herbicides. But an extremely important and less talked about issue is the presence of those roads. The omnipresent forestry access roads make the forest everywhere accessible, and this creates tremendous problems for wildlife. Huh, I'll divert for a moment to point out that we are now passing over a large tract of hardwoods. You should take a moment to enjoy them. They are becoming increasingly rare in New Brunswick, where so much of the land has now been converted to coniferous tree farms and tree plantations. In fact, you can see there has been a recent clear cut just to the lower left of this side of the screen, right beside this hardwood grove. That's sad enough, but it is important that we return to the reality of the problems caused by all these forestry access roads all throughout the forest. Many species of flora and fauna require seclusion. They have to be able to travel unmolested through broad and connected woodlands in order to survive. The loss of some of New Brunswick's larger fauna, such as wolves, is one case example. Wolves are not so adaptable as their cousins coyotes. They are not quite as good at hiding from human eyes. To be able to survive, they need expansive areas of uninterrupted woodlands, regions where they can move and den and hunt. When humans move into their territory, even if that's only by placing seldom used forestry access roads, it creates numerous problems for wolves. Such roads become natural game trails, and wolves become inclined to move out of safe territories and go into areas where they are not wanted, and will inevitably receive trouble, such as around farms. It also enables their prey species to move away, creating nutrition issues for wolves, and the ever-present forestry access roads make for easy access by both hunters and poachers. And even if we are not talking about large fauna such as wolves, these woods allow for convenient access to remote regions, which might be visited then by trappers. And as traps kill indiscriminately, this means there will be little in the way of safe breeding areas for many species of wildlife. And even persons doing much less intrusive activities, such as hiking, photography, or foraging, will inadvertently create pressure on wildlife by visiting such remote areas. The ever-present forestry access roads make this always imminently possible. The vast majority of hikers and photographers and even hunters that I know tend to be very respectful of wildlife and do their best to minimize the impact of their activities. But no matter how careful they are, the wildlife will know they are there. Some animals, such as wolves, if they know that humans are present and active in an area, will be inclined to pick up and move, interrupting denning activities. Other species will just have to try to endure the impact of our visitation, and some won't be able to manage it. Studies have shown that the more reclusive species that we find in the Maritimes really need at least five kilometers of space between forestry access roads, and they require uninterrupted means of moving between regions of forest. But it is harder and harder to find areas where there is even one kilometer of space between forestry access roads, except, perhaps, in those regions designated as national parks. I'll point out to you a very interesting study done on this by Dalhousie PhD candidate Caitlin Cunningham. In her video called Forest Connectivity in Nova Scotia, Canada, she discusses her study on the growing issue of poor connectivity between forest areas in Nova Scotia. And since Nova Scotia and New Brunswick largely share an ecosystem, it is reasonable to generalize that her findings also apply to New Brunswick. After all, the boundary between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia is not real. And by and large, both our provinces share the same coastal waters, atmospheric conditions, and Acadian forest ecosystem. 
only humans imagine any other division. As you can see, all the landscape beneath us is either tree farm, tree plantation, or clear cut, with the occasional small patch of hardwoods. And as you can see at the lakes to the right, bodies of water and watercourses are allowed to have a small green hedge around them, something which industrial forestry has left, though often reluctantly. The aircraft has come to face southeast now, and there are about 10 to 11 kilometers between us and the coast of the Bay of Fundy, and here our pilot makes a long, slow turn to show us that in every direction we look, all we see is a clear-cut landscape, a landscape that has been turned entirely into a profit source for the pulp cartels of New Brunswick. It is one thing for people to earn an honest living, but to destroy an entire landscape on this scale, to level forests so extensively as far as the eye can see, I have no better words to describe this other than madness and greed. This is a complete dismissal of environmental reality, and this utter destruction of the landscape has been empowered by a government that, as far as I can tell, is essentially owned by the interest of New Brunswick's pulp cartels, and its ability to keep on operating is empowered by an ongoing campaign of disinformation fed to the general public, and the creation of a work environment where those academics and scientists who dare question this madness find themselves subtly harassed, or quite simply, out of a job. We are passing over a very small space of, well, what briefly appeared to be intact forest, but it was in fact very brief, wasn't it? An area of forest left standing, perhaps to accommodate that lake that was in the valley. As you can probably tell, I've accelerated the speed of our flight here. In fact, I've accelerated it by 500%, because what we're going to see over the last 10 kilometers or so as we move toward the Bay of Fundy is both unpleasant and monotonous. And as you may have guessed, what it is is clear cuts and more clear cuts and more clear cuts. We see a small bit of hardwood forest up ahead, surrounded by very carefully cut and arranged coniferous woods. This is more hardwoods being borealized, the deciduous Acadian species being replaced by conifers more appropriate to boreal regions. And you can see in the section of hardwoods directly ahead of us, those bright white rows cut clearly throughout that patch of deciduous woods ahead with a bit of mixed conifer in there that represents more forest being converted into tree farm. And moving on from there, our plane continues to swing around to show once more that in every direction we look, clear cut upon clear cut upon clear cut. A cut over landscape with a destroyed forest ecosystem as far as the eye can see. We're swinging about in every direction to show the landscape from all sides, to be completely fair to what is out there, to reaffirm to you, the viewer, that we aren't simply selecting a route to portray that is especially bad as compared to the rest. And from this vantage, thousands of feet in the air, as far as we can see in every direction, the landscape is a mass of patchwork clear cuts and tree farms with virtually nothing left in the way of intact forest ecosystem. The horizon from a mere thousand feet up, about 320 meters, is 38.7 miles away, or about 62 and a quarter kilometers. And no matter how far we look out upon that expanse, no matter how much we fly over, we simply keep encountering more of the same. Destroyed ecosystem, while at the same time, Mike Leger, the executive director of Forestry New Brunswick, would try to convince you, the people of New Brunswick, that your forests are fine. But no matter how much of the New Brunswick forest ecosystem I have examined, whether by air, or through the satellite imagery portrayed through a flight simulator, or through direct satellite imagery, I have not yet been able to find, outside of national park systems, where that ecosystem is actually whole and intact. I have doubts whether such a thing really exists in New Brunswick anymore. The forests of New Brunswick have long since been devastated by the province's rampant and unchecked forestry. It would seem that finally, after the long sad journey through the wreckage that is New Brunswick forestry, we might get some relief from the environmental carnage at the coast, except that even here, right up to the very edge of the water, in the highlands just out of sight, the forests have also been subjected to cutting and tree farming. And, having borne as much visual pain as we can, we'll follow the coastal routes along the Bay of Funday back towards Moncton, where we will set down at last. This footage was donated by a local New Brunswick pilot who saw my previous videos portraying the landscape of New Brunswick via a flight simulator that used satellite imagery. 
and he wanted to affirm to the general public that, indeed, what people were seeing through that satellite imagery is in fact what is actually there. It is a painful reality that those who fly over the province will be especially aware of, at least if they are using small aircraft flying at relatively low altitudes, a few thousand feet over the ground, and at the right time of the year, in spring or autumn, when snow and foliage doesn't mask the damage that is done. From high-flying commercial aircraft, those aircraft flying 20,000 feet and higher and several hundred miles per hour, this damage is not going to be quite so noticeable. Even from a few thousand feet at the wrong time of the year, the ecosystems of the ground including disturbed forest, well, from that vantage, the destruction will seem no thicker than a thin coat of paint. And from the high altitude vantage of commercial aircraft, it would be virtually invisible. But a low-flying private plane pilot flying out in mid-spring or mid-autumn will have no choice but to endure the painful sight of New Brunswick's endless and devastated forest ecosystems. There is still time to save this ecosystem because there are still tiny islands of biodiversity left scattered here and there. But only if the damage is stopped sometime very soon. Otherwise, the predictions of scientists in the realms of ecology the world over will inevitably come to pass. Those scattered islands will not prove enough to deter the march of human-caused extinctions. And this beautiful world of biodiversity that also cleans our water and captures carbon from the air will fade away, all in the name of greed that knows no bounds. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of natural science and environmental issues. If you like our program, please take a moment to subscribe and like.